All right, Shabbat Shalom and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm pleased to be here with you today. We are in the midst of a series, a teaching series on the tribes, just broadly categorized, titled the tribes. Now, I've made this point several times, but I believe that this is the single most important subject in all of Scripture. It's a vast subject. It's something that you can't simply cover in uh, one teaching, in one sit-down. Let's sit down, open our Bibles, and because it contains the biblical narrative, the biblical prophecies, the Bible itself contains untold numbers of texts that are associated with uh, the history and the prophetic scenario as it involves or relates to the tribes. Um, once you see this, and I've heard other people say this as well, um, once you see this, it opens up your eyes to the ultimate plan and purpose of Jehovah for the entirety of the world. It's the thing that once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's everywhere. But quite often, I think people look at text, they misunderstand, they misinterpret because they're missing the key to unlocking the scriptural study that I'm talking about today. We're talking about a plan that will be brought about, implemented, and executed by a specifically chosen family. We talked about this over the last couple of weeks. They're referred to by various titles, various names. Um, but one of the things that we talked about last week is this seed of Abraham and the passing of the patriarchal plan. This group, the specially chosen family, is known as a segula, a holy nation. Uh, it's a specially chosen people with a specially given task. Speaking of this group, Jehovah says in the book of Amos, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. You alone. Now think about that. Now a lot of people get a little bit uneasy when they say that because they immediately, most people think of the world in two groups. You have non-Jews, or let's call them generically Gentiles, and you have the Jews. If you're the Jews, you fit into this group. If you're not, you don't, and you're therefore the Gentiles. Now, I spent a good deal of time over the past several months building up the case that ultimately, even though it is to and through this specially chosen group, the descendants, literally, physically, the real descendants of this group, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though the plan passes to and through this group, that ultimately that mission brings in the rest of the world. So if somebody says, well, I think that I might be a Canaanite or a Hittite or a Hivite or a Jebusite if I trace my lineage all the way back. I'm in no way connected to this group. I've taught plenty of material over the past several months and years that says ultimately the plan is that the specially chosen group will demonstrate and model the way that God told them to model in such a way that ultimately all of the families of the earth will be blessed. It's always been open. The plan has always been open to those who would grab hold of, if you will, the covenant. To grab hold of. Think of other passages in the Hebrew Bible. I think one of the, uh, the, the key texts that I have come away with that I think is so powerful and so important for people to know, it sort of epitomizes the ultimate reality comes from the book of Psalms. And I want to lay the groundwork before I get into my class today. If you'll go with me to the book of Psalms, uh, the 22nd Psalm, and I want to just look at verses 28 and 29, Psalm 28 and 29. 
I'm sorry, Psalm 22, verse 28 and 29. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to Jehovah, and all the families of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is Jehovah's, and he is ruler over all the nations. So this is the goal. This is the ultimate realization of the manifestation of God's kingdom on earth. As Isaiah puts it, that the one who plants heaven on earth, the kingdom of God, ultimately that all nations will know the one true God. Look with me a couple more passages as we get ready to get into our class today. Go with me to the prophet Isaiah, Yeshua, Isaiah chapter 45, Isaiah 45, and I just want to pick up uh, in verse 22 to start with, Isaiah 45 beginning in verse 22. Look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, a word of righteousness has gone out of my mouth, a word that shall not be reversed, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely he said to me, in Jehovah there is righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come." And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Now, whenever we look at these passages and other texts, we tend to think about how open this plan is. But what I want to do today is to begin to make people look closely at the text. I'm going to go through some text. I'm going to look at it very closely. I'm going to ask you to do the same. And I want you to consider that this vast group of the nations and from the nations who are returning to the one God, who are bowing the knee to Jehovah, if you will, many within this group might not be as you think. In other words, remember, we have this concept, and most people in the movement today, there are a lot of people who are awakening to this understanding of the tribes, but there is also this common idea that there are two choices, that people generally fit into one of two groups. Either they are Jewish, which by Jewish, in a lot of people's understanding, that is the, the word that we use to capture all of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the other group is referred to as non-Jews or Gentiles. What we're looking at here today, talking about the ends of the earth and the nations who are bowing the knee to Jehovah, I want to zoom in and look at the context surrounding these verses, and I want to build the case for something that many people might not have noticed, okay? So, I want to, you can begin anywhere. Context is very important, but I just want to sort of pick up on a few verses around what I just read, for instance. So, in 45, if you look at verse 17, but Israel shall be saved in Jehovah with an everlasting salvation. You shall not be ashamed nor confounded to all eternity. Okay? Notice it's talking about the salvation of Israel. And then a few verses later, it talks about from the ends of the earth, this group will be drawn to Jehovah. All right, so stick with me on this. Now look at verse 19. I have not spoken in secret. I'm in chapter 45 still of Isaiah. In a place of a land of darkness, I said not to the seed of Jacob... Seek me in an empty waste. I, Jehovah, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, you that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge. Those that carry about their wooden carved idol and pray to a God that cannot save. 
Declare and bring them near. Let them take counsel together. Who declared this from ancient time? Who told it from that time? Did I not, Jehovah? There is no God beside me, a just God and deliverer. There is none beside me. And then it says, look to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. Now, in context, we're talking about the salvation of Israel. We're talking about a group who is now among the nations. We're talking about a group described here who is escaping, if you will, from the nations. Now, you're going to have to stick with me because I'm going to make you read between the lines, and then I'm going to bring it all together and make it very, very plain. But a lot of times we tend to look at passages and we view them in a certain way and we interpret them in a a certain way. But what I want to tell people is it's very important to study contextually so that you, you see who is this talking to, who is speaking, who is being addressed, and what is being promised to what group. Okay. Now, most of us are familiar with the passages in Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah 4. Now, some people think that these passages are identical. There's a passage in Micah chapter 2 and a passage in Micah chapter 4. And if you casually look at them, you would think that they're identical. The prophets are given a slightly different vision or they perceive the same vision slightly differently. I'll show you. So if you go to Isaiah chapter 2, this is beginning in verse 1 in the Hebrew, it says, The word that Yeshiah, Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it will come to pass... In the last days, Akarit Hayamin, the last days, that the mountain of Jehovah's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, and they shall walk, many people, and they will say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the house. Uh, the mountain of Jehovah to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth Torah and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem. It goes on and it talks about the judging of many nations and so forth. This picture that Isaiah is describing, imagine if you will, the prophet looks and he beholds a vision. And in the vision... He describes people flowing to Jerusalem. And and they are going there to learn of the ways of Jehovah. Now, this is one of those texts which we look at and we say, remember, we only have two groups in a lot of people's minds, the Jews and the Gentiles. Most people associate this text with Gentiles flowing in. Now, it's interesting the word that's used here, that we're, and I love the translation, and all nations shall flow to it. In Hebrew, it's v'nacharu uh, elav kol hagoim. The word nahar is like a river. So the, Isaiah sees like rivers of people which he says... Kol Hagoim, all the Gentiles or all the nations. Now we we look at this word goy and, and we often will translate it as heathen or Gentile or nation. All right. But it's interesting to me that if you go to Micah 4, he sees the same vision. He is shown the same vision, and he describes it slightly differently. He too sees, verse 1, chapter 4 of Micah, in the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of Jehovah shall be established on the top of the mountains 
and it will be exalted above the hills, and peoples shall flow to it. Now, remember in Isaiah, it says, V'naharu uh, elav kol hagoim, all the Gentiles. Micah sees the same vision. He also sees rivers. But what he describes is amin, peoples. One might think that Isaiah says, these are Gentiles. I can see them. I can see the way they're dressed. They're not dressed like us. They don't look like us. They're... Micah here perhaps is a little more cautious. He sees and he says, I see the flowing. It's amin. It's people. What kind of people? Don't know. It's people. So what are they seeing? Who is it? Micah and Isaiah switch and use the term goim and amim. Are these truly Gentiles? Is that the promise of God? Is that what he ultimately says? We've covered texts which suggest so. Today I'm going to have us look at some text and think about something quite significant and I'm going to cover one of the most pivotal points in all of biblical literature such that if we don't understand what happens here, we miss the whole plan. It goes before our eyes and we misread it, we misinterpret it, we misunderstand it. Who are these within the rivers that are flowing to Jerusalem? What did the prophets see. If you look at Micah chapter 4, verse 5, this is in context. We're talking about this great move towards Jerusalem, the flowing to Jerusalem. Notice the distinction that is maintained. Look at this. Uh, chapter 4, verse 5. For let all people walk everyone in the name of his God but we will walk in the name of Jehovah, our God, forever and ever. Now that's an interesting passage because it's at a time when the rivers of people are flowing to Jerusalem and as if to suggest at the end that one group will be, like it says, walking in the name of Jehovah, very, very interesting. If you read on in context, it will continue to talk about who this particular group is. I'm not going into the depth of it at this point. Remember, context is essential. Now, what I do is I try to read between the white spaces. As we say in English, read between the lines. In the Hebrew, you know if you've listened to me for any amount of time, that the chapters are a modern um, way of breaking these sacred texts. In the Hebrew, we have white spaces. When I stopped at verse 5, so did the Hebrew. Now, doesn't mean that what follows doesn't apply. It's just it's a good place to move to the next thing that I want to cover. Now, another passage that I want to touch on comes from the book of Zechariah. <clears throat> Zechariah, and I want you to go ahead and go with me <clears throat> to Zechariah chapter 8. Zechariah chapter 8. Now, context is essential because there is a verse within Zechariah 8 that a lot of people have memorized incorrectly. I've heard it quoted incorrectly. I've heard it used to teach things incorrectly. And I think that after today's class, we will understand something based upon this that's associated with my study of uh, the current series that we're on, 
So I, I have to ask you to pay attention. Not that you're not, but if you weren't paying attention, you have to pay attention now because we're gonna work through something uh, as we build on this class, there is a lot that you must take in. In Zechariah chapter eight, we're dealing contextually with something which is eschatological. It is prophetic, it is something of the end days. Remember Isaiah two, Micah four, talk about the akarit hayamim in the latter days. Prophets are very clear quite often when they're speaking of a time not of their own time. And they, they will often use phrases like, and in the latter days, or they'll say, and in days to come, right? So this is one of those contexts in Zechariah chapter 8, um, and it's clearly connected, by the way, with the wording of Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4. So you have to understand that these texts are related. It's not going to be long before I have to bring out the dry erase board, which those of you who come to the office know, I use this board to put my ideas on and work these thoughts out. But sometimes it's very difficult to convey one text, go to another and convey it and connect them. But when you can align these texts side by side, like we do with Micah 4 and Isaiah 2, and notice the distinctions you begin to see things that weren't previously uh, clear. In Micah chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, it talks about old men and women and children once again going into the streets of Jerusalem. I, I've told this story every time I'm in Jerusalem now, when we're walking through the old city, it never fails that we'll see an old man or an old woman leaning on a staff because of their age, children playing in the streets. You are, when you see this up close and personal, you are witnessing the fulfillment of prophecy because there was a time when Jerusalem was void of the people of Israel, that there was no joy and weddings heard in the street. I've not been to Israel where I didn't witness bar mitzvahs and weddings flowing through the streets. So this is looking from the time that it's written to the time that we are now in, I should point out very clearly. Verse 6 begins to talk about a remnant, a remnant who will return. Now look at verse uh, 7. We're talking about the context of Zechariah 8. In verse 7, Thus says Jehovah of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the east country and from the west country, and I will bring them in. They will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they will be my people, and I will be their God in truth, and in righteousness, okay? So you have to understand that this is talking about, contextually, different glimpses of the redemption. It's like Zechariah says, and there'll be children playing in the streets, and men and women so old that they have to have a staff to prop them up. End of vision. Next vision. The Lord says, I will save my people from the east and from the west, and I'll bring them back. You see, it's different glimpses of the redemption. Now, look at verse 9. Uh, in this particular uh, text, it's talking about the restoration and, and coming back and the foundation of the house was laid. Again, this, this is reminiscent, similar language to Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah chapter 4. And it, it talks about as you work your way through, you go down to chapter uh, 8 and verse 12, and it says, uh, And I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all things. It's talking about the remnant of what people? His people that he's bringing back. Look, 
And it will come to pass that as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel. We're talking about two distinct groups here. So will I save you. You shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. The patriarchal promise is that this group will be a blessing. That ultimately, through them, blessing will come to all the families of the earth. But notice, they must be saved to bring this about. They've been scattered among the nations, known as distinct groups, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. They've got to come back, both groups. Now, look at verse 14. I'm going to read 14 through 17, which are contained within the white spaces. For thus says Jehovah of hosts, as I intended to do you mischief... That's a bad day, right? He's talking to his people. When your fathers provoked me to anger, says Jehovah of hosts, and I did not relent, so have I turned about and do purpose in these days to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Interesting. Judah, the house of Judah, is mentioned specifically And only in this vision, fear not. These are the things that you shall do. He's talking to the house of Judah. See, one of the things we're going to learn in this study as we continue and we progress is to make a clear distinction between the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Here, Judah is addressed, Speak every man the truth to his neighbor, Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. Let none of you devise evil in your hearts against his neighbor. Love no false oath. For all these things I hate, saith Jehovah. White space. Your fathers provoked me, he says. This is talking about a literal group. It's not spiritual or allegorical. It's not referring to a group other than the people he chose. It's very specific and clear. No ambiguity. Now I want you to get down to verse 20. We're still in the context of the redemption of Israel. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come people. All the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go speedily to entreat the favor of Jehovah, to seek Jehovah of hosts. I will go also. And many people and strong nations shall come to seek Jehovah of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before Jehovah. Now, in context, we're talking about Israel and Judah being among the nations. And here it talks about many peoples will come. Who are these people? Now I'm going to get to a passage that is, I believe, currently not being interpreted correctly. Not everybody agrees with Ross. I know that's hard to believe. But there are some who hold different views, and I'm okay with that. But I'm sharing with you what I understand this text to mean it will be very important as we work our way through because I want to identify who is this group. Verse 23. Now, by the way, verse 23 is set off totally by itself. It's surrounded by white spaces. This one verse. So here's what it says. Thus says Jehovah of hosts, Ko Amar Yehovah Tzavit. In those days, 
This is one of our prophetic indicators, right? It shall come to pass that ten men out of all the languages of the nations shall take hold, shall seize the hem of the garment of him that is a man of Judah, saying, we will go with you because we heard that God is with you. We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, let me tell you how this is normally understood. This is normally understood and often misquoted this way. Ten Gentiles will grab the skirt or the hem of the garment of a Jewish man saying, we'll go with you because we heard that God is with you. Ten Gentiles will grab that Jewish person. And they take this text and they look around them at all the non-Jews. Remember, most or many people have two groups. You got to fit in one. You're either Jewish or you're not Jewish, i.e. you're Gentile. And the way they understand that is 10, 10 Gentiles grab one Jew and say, we're going to go with you. Now, that's the way a lot of people read that. Now, notice it doesn't say that. You're thinking, well, I mean, you're being kind of picky here. You're, you're, are you straining at a gnat and swallowing a camel? What are you doing here? It says 10 men from all the languages of the nations. Okay, I want you to remember that ratio because we'll come back to it later. And nobody jump ahead of me here, just wait. Put that on a shelf. Remember the 10 and the one. I want you to go with me while we're in Zechariah and go to chapter 10, Zechariah chapter 10 and verse six. Zechariah 10, six, and I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, and I will bring them back again, for I have had mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off. For I am Jehovah their God, and shall hear them, and they of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their hearts shall rejoice as through wine, and their children shall see it and be glad. Their hearts shall rejoice in Jehovah. I will whistle to them and gather them. For I have redeemed them, and they shall increase as they have increased uh, before. And I will sow them among the peoples, and they shall remember me in far countries... They will live with their children and shall return. And I will bring them back out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Ashur. And I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon so that there will be no room for them. And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves in the sea. And all the deeps of the river shall dry up, and the pride of Asher shall be brought down. The scepter of Egypt shall depart, and I will strengthen them in Jehovah. They shall walk up and down in his name, says Jehovah. I'm going to strengthen the house of Judah. I'm going to save the house of Joseph. He says, I'm going to whistle for them and gather them. Imagine these groups scattered among the nations. And at that time, in that day, he's going to cause them to come back. They, though they be sown among the nations, he says, they're going to remember me in foreign countries. Psalm 22 says, and, and all the ends of the earth shall remember me and return to me. How are you going to remember and return to one to whom you've never been oriented towards? 
Who is this group that is remembering and returning to Jehovah of hosts in the latter days? Who? Says they'll return. Says I'm going to bring them back. Gather them, bring them over and over. And then it says, they shall walk up and down in my name. Remember, Micah chapter 4 and verse 5 says, and all the people shall walk in the name of their God, but we shall walk in the name of Jehovah our God. Who is it that is walking in the name of Jehovah of hosts in that day. Now, if I could really be dramatic, and the lights were to go down and the curtain would close, we could have a slight intermission and open back up to Act 2. What I just did was present you with several texts, some of which having been interpreted differently than the way I just presented them. It now falls to me to make sense of everything that I just covered. Because what I need to do, what I want to do, is communicate one of the most significant things in all of biblical history that if you don't understand this, confusion is the result. If I don't explain what's coming next, people will not understand what Scripture is looking forward to. All right? So it's important. So we're going to look at a text, um, a historical point. It's pivotal, and from this point forward in Scripture, everything changes. You could almost put a tab here in the Bible and say, from this point forward, you have to notice something very specific. Go with me to the book of 1 Kings. The book of 1 Kings. And I'm going to talk through, and I'll read here and there. Um, we're going to begin in 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. The story goes like this. You remember now, I'm, I'm moving quickly through the history of Israel. Imagine we just flew in time through the period of the judges, the ascendancy of Israel as a nation. The tribes are together and they're living within the land and we just went through all that. We just passed a time when the people were not satisfied with Jehovah being their king and they rejected Jehovah. They wanted a king like the nations which was not ordained by Jehovah. But Jehovah says they have rejected me. 1 Samuel 8, we just blew past. We just went by 1 Samuel chapter 12 and we talked about the evils that they committed in asking for a king like the nations. And we have King David who rises after King Saul. And then we have Solomon after David. And Solomon loved many foreign women. I just covered a lot of time in a few minutes. I want to pick up with Solomon and the departure which sets the stage for Act 2 in today's class. Not only did Solomon love many foreign women, he attached himself to these in love, 
It says in 1 Kings 11, 3. And these women turned away his heart. And I would say, you know, according to the writer, he, he, had, he wasn't an, a victim in this. I mean, he went along willingly, so I might add that. They didn't twist his arm. He was a willing participant in this departure. We read later that Solomon's heart was not perfect. Uh, the root word there means whole, complete, like his father David's heart. So he's, he's off the rails, as we say. He's departed from the faith. And, and look, it's not that he didn't know God. He, it says he departed from the God that had appeared to him twice. Now go with me to chapter 11, 1 Kings 11, and I'm going to read uh, verse 9 and 10. Jehovah was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from Jehovah, the God of Israel, who had twice appeared to him and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which Jehovah commanded. God appeared to him twice, told him not to go after other gods, and he did not obey what God said. Now look down at verse 11. So that Jehovah says to Shlomo, says to Solomon, since this is your mind, since this is your mind, and you hast not kept my covenant, my statutes, which I commanded you, I will surely rend the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet in your days, I'll not do it for David, your father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of your son. Nevertheless, I will not rend all the kingdom away, but will give one tribe to your son for David, my servant's sake, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Solomon, since you've made up your mind in this wicked choice of yours, there's, there's nothing left for me to do but to rend the kingdom from your hand. Now remember, Jehovah has made promises to David which cannot be annulled. That promise must remain intact. So he says, I'm not going to rend all the kingdom I'm going to leave one tribe to honor that promise, but the rest I'm taking away, and I'm giving it to your servant. Very important. This is one of the, if not the, most significant events in all of biblical literature, and people don't know it well. Because they don't, they misunderstand the prophetic plan. Um. Go down to verse 26 of chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11, verse 26. And Jeroboam, Yoravam in Hebrew, the son of Nevat and Ephrathi um, of Zerada, Solomon's servant, whose mother, uh, his name was Zeruah, a widow woman, he lifted up his hand against the king, and this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. And all and the man Jeroboam was a mighty warrior. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the labor of the house of Joseph. So I want you to understand that this man... Um, by the name of Jeroboam that we're, that we're introduced to, is recognized, even though he's an opponent of, of uh, Solomon uh, because of his, uh, his work details and so forth, and because some of the projects that Solomon's got going on, it's very burdensome on these kingdoms, these tribes in the north. Right, And we'll, we'll talk more about that in another class. We're going to zoom in on that. I'm giving you an overview right now. What ultimately happens, though, is that Solomon recognizes that this Jeroboam is an industrious young man. He's, he's a good leader, and he places Jeroboam as a ruler 
over the house of Joseph, which is the ten tribes, okay? The northern tribes, let's say. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you an account, and then I'm going to act it out so that it sticks in your mind and it makes sense because it is upon this class that I will build many, many things, but you've got to get this. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 29. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem. We're talking about this industrious man who is over the northern kingdom, if you will, the northern tribes known as the house of Joseph, that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite is what it says in English, found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces. For thus says Jehovah, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, because they have forsaken me, have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, Milcham, the god of the children of Ammon. It's like, remember, in Deut- your, it says in the Bible, your, your gods, you have more gods than you have cities. People that paint Israel as they're the perfect example, they just hadn't read their Bible, right? Uh, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes, to keep my statutes and my judgment, as David his father did. Yet I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand. I'll make him a prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I chose, because he, David, kept my commands and statutes, and I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you. That is the ten tribes. And to his son, I'll give one tribe that David, my servant, may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there, and I will take thee, and you shall reign according to all that your soul desires, and you shall be king over Israel. All right, now this is where you got to follow it closely. And it will be if you'll hearken to all that I command you and walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes, my commandments, as David, my servant, did, that I will be with you and build you a sure house as I built with David, and I will give Israel to you, and I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Now, I have designed, and Dave, you're going to have to get ready. Back up just enough so that I can stand up and act this out. Huh? Now, this is a garment. I used this example before and I think it makes sense. Now, it says that this garment, this new garment, is taken and it's torn into 12 pieces. So if you take this garment and you tear it, this is the way the prophet would do this. It says that he tore it in 12 pieces because what he wants to illustrate is what is going to take place in regards to the chosen people. That this kingdom, which was once united as a single garment, is now torn 
into 12 pieces. But he doesn't say the math doesn't work. He says to Jeroboam, I'm go he's got 12 pieces. He says, I've got 10 pieces. I'm going to give you 10. And he hands these to Jeroboam. He says, now, if you follow me, if you keep my commandments, if you do what it is that I charge you to do, I'm going to build you a sure house as I built David. I'm not going to take the whole kingdom from him. I'm going to give one to David. You see what I'm saying here? I'm going to give one. So now we have this kingdom represented by the garment, and this is pivotal. If we don't understand this division, we miss the plan of God described by the prophets. Effectively, we now have Israel represented by my garment here, and we have them separated into two piles of material. The next few verses from chapter 11, verse 40 through 43, Solomon seeks to kill, right? He's, he's upset over this. And then he dies. Now, let me look at, let me open up back to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings 11. And if you go with me to uh, 40, Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam. Jeroboam flees, Right? And then in verse 43, Solomon slept with his fathers, was buried in the city of David, and Rehoboam, his son, rises up in his stead. Now, I know what people are going to do because it's natural. People begin to start defining who's in this group, who's in this group. We're not ready for that yet because we have to build something very significant at the present. I mean, I know I'm talking to people who know the Bible, but uh, I just want to tell the story. Just let me tell the story. So you have 10 and you have one. Now, the interesting thing is that Jeroboam is, is now in a position of authority over this group, which we've already identified at least by one name as the house of Joseph. This group is associated with David and Jerusalem. We don't really have a name for it yet. I mean, we do, we kind of know, but I'm, I want you to understand, this is the house of Joseph. These are under Jeroboam. This is the 10 tribes. This is what is left because of God's promise to David. It's two, it's called one, okay? Okay. Now, a, a request is made. A request is made by Jeroboam and the people. And I'm going to read it to you in chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel. Look, don't, don't miss this. Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel go to Rehoboam and they make a request. All right? And the request is this. Your father made our yoke hard. Now, therefore, make you the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter and will serve you. And he said unto them, Depart for three days, and then come back to me. And the people departed, and then what happens is in some ways tragic, but it's part of the plan. 
So don't think for one minute that God was surprised by the outcome. He is orchestrating the outcome. Rehoboam has this small remnant left. Rehoboam had the request from Jeroboam and the people of Israel, and he goes to the old men, the old men who were Solomon's advisors, and he said, hey, look, Jeroboam and the people from the house of Joseph came, you know, the 10 tribes, and they said, yeah, of course we know the 10 tribes. We know the Bible. And he said, look, he asked that God, that we would make the load lighter than my dad had on them. You know, he was abusive and had all these building projects and used corvée labor and all that. They're asking me, he's talking to the old men, the advisors of his dad, they're asking me to make the load lighter. And the old men who had served his father said, do it. If you do that, if you go with their request, they'll serve you. And he said, okay, all right, let me think about it. So then he goes to the young men, his friends that he grew up with, and he said, hey, look, you know, Jeroboam, um, who was over the house of Joseph and the ten tribes, has come to me and he said, if I make the load lighter, that he'll, they'll, they'll serve me. What do you think I should do? What do you think they said? Look at verse 8. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that had grown up with him, who stood before him, and he said to them, What counsel give you that we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make lighter the yoke which your father had put upon us? And the young men that had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall speak to this people that spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter to us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. That's a pretty dirty response, by the way. And now, whereas my father did burden you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Now, that's not the answer that Jeroboam and Joseph, the house of Joseph, the ten tribes, desired. So they go back to the house of David and the group in Jerusalem, and they said, what's your answer? The people return and ask. And I want to read, let me pick up uh, verse 15, by the way. And the king hearkened not to the people, for it was so brought about from Jehovah that he might perform his saying, which Jehovah spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite. So he doesn't listen. And he tells them such. When they come, he says the message that the young guys gave him, and it is from this point forward that these two groups, now listen to me, to this day have remained separate. Now, I know people are thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, there are people from this group who joined this group Yes, there are people who throughout the history, the biblical narratives, who did filter from this. So it's not strictly like people go, well, it's uh, this group, this group, this group, and, and these tribes, and these two only represent this tribe and this tribe. It's not that clean cut. But I want you to understand these two groups represented by my garment have remained separate from that time, okay? Now, these are going to be studied closely in the next weeks and months so that we can identify all sorts of biblical subjects and, and carefully discern and interpret Scripture on its own terms. Now, stay with me. Go to 1 Kings chapter 12, um, and let me just read verse 19. I want you to start noticing 
how things are. If you don't read this carefully, you might miss something. So Israel rebelled against the house of David to this day. You see? This group is against this group to this day. And that's still true, by the way. Still true. Um, now go to uh, verse 20. And it came to pass when all Israel, ten tribes, heard that Jeroboam was come back, that they sent and called him to the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. All right? And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. Okay? Everybody so far so good? And 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel. They're going to fight against Israel. Now, how is Israel fighting against Israel? Notice it's the one tribe, as it's called in prophecy, is going to fight this group. Now, what we have to know is that from this point forward, everything in Scripture becomes very, very significant, and it's easy to miss the details if you don't understand this part. Now, go to verse 22. Uh, actually, I'll just talk through this. Um, in verse chapter 1 Kings 12, 22 through 24, that the word of God comes to a man of God and says, uh, don't fight them. Don't fight them. Uh, verse 24, thus says Jehovah, you shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. He's talking to this group. Don't you fight this group. You return every man to your house because this thing is from me. That's what Jehovah tells this group. This thing, meaning the division, is from him. And they hearkened therefore to the word of Jehovah and turned and went their way according to Jehovah. Now, from verse 25 on, we see that immediately this group messes up. I'm talking straight out of the chute. Now, there are some who think this group has been perfect all along. No, you haven't. We're going to talk about that. This group's been bad. This group's been bad. Teachers in this group led them astray. Teachers in this group led them astray. It's a big mess. But we're not talking about that group right now. This group. The ten tribes under Jeroboam. They, Jeroboam is afraid that his people are going to run back and join up with Rehoboam, and then there goes his kingdom. So he says, look, no need to go to Jerusalem for the festivals. I got some beautiful places here. Have you taken your children to see the temple at Dan? We have a good kids program. We have nice music. Good praise and worship. It's nice and shady. You don't have to get out and go on the hot journey. You've got children. It's hard. We've got Sunday services for you here that are absolutely the best. We have fog machines. You name it. That's where you got to go. So this was the appeal. They he even set up different um, festivals. You know, he changed the times and seasons because he... He just wanted to do what he could to keep the people there, and he sets up these two idolatrous sites at Dan and Bethel, and he begins by erecting golden calves at both of these locations. And what he says to them is, these are your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. What does Scripture tell us about these two groups? How is it that we will make sense of the prophetic plan if we don't understand that these two groups are separate and they are addressed separately, 
They are described differently. They are called by different names. What is addressed to this group may not apply to this group and vice versa. We have prophets that are sent to this group. We have prophets that are sent to this group. These differences must be understood. When biblical teachers think that these groups are together, and I even hesitate to bring them together in the illustration because they are not. When Bible teachers put these two together and apply prophecies that go with one to the other and the other to the other, they are misleading the flock. They don't understand. We've got to make sure that we keep these separate. Now, over the course of the next few weeks, we're going to talk about certain things which will make a lot of sense, but only because we'll be able to look at this and use this simple illustration because I think it's very significant. Now, initially, the way I'm going to wrap up today is that these 10 are together. I mean, they are one group right there. And these two are together. Now, again, remember, I'm, I'm going to show this in Scripture as we work through this, that some few members from, like, one of these tribes could have drifted down. We know that that happened. We have biblical texts that suggest that. But generally, we've got two distinct groups. How will we recognize in Scripture when one group is being addressed versus the other? How will we tell them apart? Currently, Everything is together and it's mixed up. Remember, people give you two choices. You're either a Jew, an Israelite, they lump it all together, all this stuff together, or you're a non-Jew, a Gentile. But Scripture has assigned the collection of all of these 12, has assigned them a great task, both groups, and together. In order to bring about the fulfillment and the achievement of God's plan, these groups have to be together. So if we can't identify who these groups are in, in antiquity, let alone in modern days, then the plan can never come to fruition. But I want to tell you, that when Zechariah 8, verse 23, says that in that day, ten men from all the languages of the nations will grab the hem of the garment of him that's a Jew, saying, we'll go with you, for God is with you. We've heard this. I believe that in context, Zechariah 8 is talking about the redemption of Israel and the bringing back of this group. And that, my friends, is the reason for the ratio. Ten to one. The garment is divided into 12 pieces, but it's called ten to one. Now, I will continue this class next week to tell you that this group of 10 does not stay in this nice, neat little stack. Something happens. And something happens to this group. Ultimately, all the pieces of the garment must come back together and become a united Israel, which then leads to a world union. Until that happens, we have two separate groups 
And it is incumbent on me to answer the question from the biblical text, what happened to the ten, what happened to the one, join us next week, 10.30 a.m. Central Standard Time, right here, Shabbat Shalom. We'll take a few minutes and uh, we'll come back for a dialogue.